So, um, well, I guess Princess Big Mac is best princess? There! <laughs> there! There! I said it! Are you happy? I want to make something perfectly clear before we actually start talking about this episode more in depth. This was a long-awaited uh, episode. In fact, I should say this episode was a long time coming. Should have happened before, if you ask me. Considering this is both the episode that analyzes the character of Luna a bit more in depth. It, it gives her a nice redemption arc. It explores her psychology and her emotional state after the Nightmare Moon event. And it also gives us a much more whole and a complete visual information of what our dream-related powers are supposed to be like. So this is a great episode for the character of Luna. And yet, what everyone, what all the fans are going to take away from this is that Big Mac freaking transforms into an Alicorn Princess a la Sailor Moon. <laughs> with, the freaky, with the freaking modified Sailor Moon transformation theme. Dun, da, 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 da. <laughs> And apparently, so he dreams of being a princess. Also, yeah, which, also, which see, makes me, which, which, which is another point that makes question that makes us question his uh, sexual orientation. Who cares? Who cares? I don't. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> since we're okay, so since we're at it, Lyra and Bonbon bon are literally fused together in their dreams, and they are happy about it because they are such yeah. good friends. Yeah. Honestly, at this point, you should start the drinking game. Every time this show reminds us of how much so good of a friends they these two are when they're so always together, we should take a, <laughs> a shot. <laughs> at this point, it, it is less of a knowing, winking eye to the audience, and more like an in-your-face uh, manifesto glued to your fascial area and you cannot get it away and you have this piece of paper stuck on your face that says here he here we we now proclaim this lesbian couple canon but we're never going to say that out loud because kids shows <laughs> but they are such good friends <laughs> another interesting fact we learned the uh, last episode that uh, Minuet apparently uh, often visits Ponyville. Yeah, okay, well, yes, okay, so yes, yes. That she even stays overnight. Well, 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 okay, we established that Princess Twilight Sparkle is a bad friend already. <laughs> Moving on, this episode. No, uh, uh, last episode, Minuet uh, stated that she often yes, uh, I know. visits Ponyville. Yes, I know. And, and this I... episode, she is there during the night. Of course she the, is. During the dream sequence, which says that she stays overnight in Ponyville. Yes, of, yes. Which makes me question why. Uh, threesome? I don't know. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> don't ask. Don't ask me questions that shall never receive answers outside of fan fiction world. So don't ask. So let's just stick with what we know about this episode. <laughs> Which was a really good episode that, for me, didn't really pick itself up up until the second half, which was amazing, I have to say. It's where the creativity truly... the potential of creativity of this episode really shines and goes all out as it should be in the second half of the, of the episode, in which we get to the shared... <laughs> the shared dream experience, which was fantastic, I have to say. Those guys are amateurs. <sighs> they are amateurs at dreaming. Seriously. I don't know. Filthy Rich riding a wave made of his own bits. <laughs> okay, <laughs> throwing yeah. throwing uh, Kamehameha waves of, made of gold bits at the, uh, at the really, shadow really monster. That was... His... That was really, really uh, it really fits his character. Yeah, that was that was really that was really If you have a problem, throw money at it until it's no longer a problem. That was great. Okay. I loved it. And I also love uh Sarah Spike the Knight uh, riding giant therapy hooves to battle, <laughs> to glorious battle against the evil shadow monster that's causing all this conflict. Uh, <laughs> uh, this shadow monster thingy don't you think it looked really awesome as that giant pony figure? 
Yes, this was a great, great idea. It is the literal foggy embodiment of Luna's own guilt, which she created for the purpose, for the specific purpose of torturing herself so that she would never forget what it's like to be what she became and the suffering she brought. So really, this whole episode, uh, from, an arc, from an arc and a character's it, arc standpoint... It begs, it begs the question, why did it only happen now? Actually, uh, actually, about, no. It's more than a year, and only yeah. now it's becoming a problem? Well, uh, it, get, it gets out of hand within two nights? That's a bit suspicious, I think. You could justify this by saying that a shadow monster... What was its name again? Uh, something with a T. Dum, uh, dum, dum, dum. Okay, it doesn't matter. The, the shadow uh, monster, it's the representation of Luna's own guilt that she created for the specific purpose of keeping herself... Tentabus. Hmm? Tentabus. Tentabus. Thank you. But you could, you could surmise that uh, this monster, uh, it took some time to properly get power because it took some time for it to become sentient. You know, it's... It was born for a specific purpose, and that was to give nightmare. I mean, Luna nightmares. <laughs> that was to. It was. It was to give nightmare Lunas. <laughs> it was Lunas to nightmare. It was. I was saying opposite world. Okay. It was created for the purpose of giving nightmares to the princess of the night, so that she would remember what's what she caused. Because at the end of the day, she she is her own greatest uh, enemy. At this point, she that's kind of what she always been. She's always been her own greatest enemy. When she had self-doubt and she and she had envy and jealousy, she turned into Nightmare Moon. And now that she's rid of Nightmare Moon, she doesn't trust herself to become not Nightmare Moon again. So really, the, like I said, the long-awaited episode in which we explore Luna's own self-conscious, self-esteem, and her own fears. As a whole, so, and that's what the shadow monster actually represented. It was the, the very essence of her guilt that could be also interpreted as a remnant of Nightmare Moon that took over her own personality. Which is really interesting because it contradicts one of the comic books. Yeah, you know what? Uh, the it, it, it is okay. Story arc. Honestly, honestly, I'm going to say this: the comic books have gone completely on the wrong path since the very beginning, one. And second, I stopped reading them because at some point they became so completely stupid. I, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, but after they kind of jumped the shark after that one fantastic story arc involving the parallel worlds, which was both the apex of the series and the beginning of, the, of its downfall. Honestly, so... Yeah. Yeah. Also, uh, also, I don't, I don't know if you agree with this, but the second arc of the comic, the one involving Nightmare Remedy, was complete garbage to me. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry if you liked it, but it was completely. The, no, the Nightmare Rarity arc was. Uh, I yeah, it was like terrible. It. So not at all. So if that is completely thrown, completely out of any canon whatsoever, uh, I will only be happy for that. Uh, but speaking of canon and speaking of this episode, I like the fact that. Uh, the shadow monster, which was part of herself, of Luna, doesn't disappear at the end, but it goes back inside her, because it's actually a part of her that she has to learn to accept and deal with, because it's her own personal darkness. This is actually a very nice message, because... We it, all have a dark side. Yes, it's a nice message It's a nice message that's delivered in a subtle and visual manner. Unlike everything else about the show that's spelled out to you by Princess Twilight, more of the day, Sparkle. <laughs> Prince, uh, Princess of Exposition? No, that's Celestia. Oh, uh, right. And sometimes right. Luna. Luna's also <laughs> very much Princess of Exposition. Everyone actually at some point is the Exposition Princess. Even Rainbow Dash in this episode was the unnecessarily... Forced in exposition, princess. <laughs> Except Big Mac. No, Big Mac is princess of um, uh... summoning talking apples. Yep, I don't know. <laughs> Big Mac is the princess of <laughs> Sailor Moon. <laughs> is the princess of Sailor Moon references, I guess. <laughs> if you didn't notice, uh, as he was just a unicorn, the first. Uh, when Applejack noticed him, yeah. he summoned uh, an apple that Apple said, yep, on, and uh, fly flew away. 
Yeah, that's great. It also, and then he and then he became a full fledged Alicorn princess because it was a dream, so you can do anything, and anything they did. I mean, yes, more often than not, I come across these uh, stories involving dreamscapes of some description in which the imagination should be let run loose, but more often than not, they don't capitalize on the potential of creativity given by this sort of scenarios. This episode seemed a bit meh to me in the first half because it wasn't really doing anything too imaginative. But then the second uh, half kicks in... In a dream scene, uh, sequence you normally can go all out. You can do whatever you want. And so far this, uh, this, uh, this whole uh, show did, uh, did very restrict the dream se sequences. It was actually well paced and, uh, and uh, nuanced in the... Uh, Apple Bloom episode earlier on this season, the one involved yeah, their own it, nightmares. It, it, yeah. it got crazier and crazier over time. Yes, it, it, is a, it is a matter of escalation, you know, you don't throw everything right at the viewer's face right at the, the very beginning, you do an escalation thing, you go by degree, a little bit more every passing minute up until you get, uh, you build up the the dream, you build up what can be done in the dream and then you explode in the climax of the episode and deliver all the creativity that's possible to deliver in the in the context of this particular flash animation. And they really delivered some really cool stuff, I dare say. Not so much for the first half though, because the first half was sort of like the presentation, so to speak. Okay, this is what's going to happen, and now let's throw it all out of the window. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, let's actually go, speaking of going by degree, let's go by degree and talk about this episode's story. It starts off with Luna having this nightmare about being Nightmare Moon in a nightmare. Uh, the nightmare in, within the nightmare, Nightmareception. <laughs> Yes, wow! <laughs> stupid, <laughs> stupid Hans Zimmer's dramatic cues. So anyway, uh, and of course she, she dreams of the main six coming to defeat her. And already this Free already her, not defeat. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. This scene at the beginning of the episode, the be before the title credits, already raises so many questions. So it is implied that had the shadow monster in her nightmare not gone off the band and basically abandoned the dream, this dream would have ended with Nightmare Moon not being defeated by the main six, but rather winning and thus everyone loses. And if you think about it, you can only assume, uh, given the explanation that Luna gave about the shadow monster that, have, that has always been haunting her own dreams by her own choice, this means she's been having this very same dream ever since she was released of her Nightmare Moon uh, persona, so to speak. So, so, she's been having the, so she's been having this nightmare of her worst fear of Nightmare Moon actually winning. She's been having this dream bottling up in her emotional state, bottled up in the depth of her subconscious for over one year, dreaming this, this nightmare. That's, that's really sad. Hmm. Yes, that is really sad. And only later on in the episode they we actually uh, properly address this issue of her own guilt. And you can actually see how much she is suffering. Now, I have to say, I would have preferred slightly less dialogue and more just, you know, the episode, the episode showing that suffering more than the episode telling us that suffering while showing it at the same time. It gets a bit uh, unnecessary. Yeah. In a visual me uh, medium, uh, normally show don't tell. Yes, I'm a I'm a big fan of show don't tell. Sometimes you get tell don't show, which is bad, and other times you get something like this episode, which is show and tell at the same time, which is Just to make sure that everyone gets it. <laughs> which is a bit of I get that it's a children's cartoon, but look at what other children's cartoons are doing nowadays. They are not. F spoon feeding their messages or their morals in any way they are just showing you the raw emotion and the psychology at hand watch any episode of steven universe or gravity falls and you will get that but anyway uh my little pony friendship is magic uh this is still a great episode mind you this is just this is but a minor complaint that doesn't really factor in the overall enjoyment of this episode 
Hmm. <coughs> now I'm questioning. Do we think this is a good episode because it's a good episode, or because we had bad episodes before? Well, considering this episode comes right after the the, the beautiful one involving Triad Sparkles catching up with our cantonal friends, which felt a little bit more like a Steven Universe episode, I dare say this was effectively a good episode. And in fact, I also dare say that uh, in spite of this season having somewhat of a storyline involving the MacGuffin map, I actually like better the episodes that don't actually involve the MacGuffin map, because it feels forced to have this freaking map coming out completely arbitrarily and telling you, hey, uh, such and such, go there and solve this uh, friendship problem because I'm the map, all-knowing map that has to tell you. <laughs> I don't think um, the previous uh, episode, the episode before this, the one involving Twilight and her countered friends and catching up and all that, it wouldn't have been as strong as an episode if the whole reason Twilight would have to go to Canterlot was because the MacGuffin map would have told her. I am so glad that she decided to do that on her own volition. So, showing that these characters have some agency of their own. They don't need a freaking map to tell yeah, them what they need to do. But, but uh, despite all that, I'm quite surprised that the map didn't really do much for the season so far. And like I said, I like it better this way. <laughs> I'm, I'm just I'm just surprised they they made made it out to be the next big thing. Speaking um, of, come to think of it, the McGuffey map might all be a giant red herring, because for all you know, the map might stick around for other seasons to come. We don't know what this season is building up itself towards, but I do know something. Last episodes, uh, there was a starlight glimmer hidden in the background. Re I know. Yes, reading a newspaper. Uh, so. Uh, reading the menu in the. She's clearly stalking Twilight Sparkle. And now I have to wonder if uh, what this season is actually going to build itself over is going to involve Twilight Sparkle and her old Canterlot friends. Especially Moon Dancer. And Starlight Glimmer doing something to her. Imagine that. Oh. Now that would be. Well, An interesting direction. To find, to find that out, we will have to wait a while. Yes, speaking of we finding are going out. We're to a minor hiatus mid season. I hate you, Hasbro! Again? Again? They did it, they did it already for, for, for the episode 100. Yes. Oh, come on. <sighs> and as, as far as I know, it's not even clear when the second half starts to air. Oh, you know why? Because the Equestria Girls film is coming out in September. Oh. So they decided to drag this season out as long as, as it is possible to drag something out, which is irritating. Yay. We have an episode to talk to, don't we? <laughs> to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the shadow monster escapes from from Luna's dreams, and he starts oh, to <laughs> yeah, he starts to haunt the dreams of the main six because he learned about them through Luna's own nightmare of Nightmare Moon fighting the main six. Which is also an, an interesting thing because if she had the same dream for over a year, only now the Tentabus goes to the main six? Well, like I said, maybe yeah. maybe it took a while for it to gain sentience, or maybe it just needed to gain enough power to do so, and and and, it, and since Luna is a princess, it takes a while to take power from her, or maybe they just should have done this episode earlier on in the previous seasons, but then again, the beauty about season five is that it's finally going to a more mature route, and that uh, uh, previous I, I seasons did after, not dare to approach. I, I think after season four, they started making this show more for the bronies and less for the... Oh, show. actually, they started doing that uh, by the very end of season two, <laughs> with the Cantorot wedding. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, season two began with freaking John Delancey playing as Discord. How do you interpret that? <laughs> So yeah. really, they started this off already by season 2, because by season 2 they were more aware of the fact that this show had become a pop cultural phenomenon, with a lot of adult funs. 
So, so yes, it's it's actually a slow process that that started ever since season two, and it gets a little more obvious each and every uh, new season. Season five began strong with the freaking cult mentality slash totalitarian regime commentary on the very misconstrued and warped vision of what communism is supposed to be. So there you go, and, and, and now we have this Luna episode that was, a, again, a long time coming, and we finally get to explore this character in all of her psychological and emotional flaws that she has to overcome, thanks to the help of her friends, because friendship is freaking magic! Of course friendship is magic! Also, I really like the title of this episode, I think it's the best title this show has ever had, because it... It's a direct reference, like I said last time, to a Philip K. Dick novel. And it, it doesn't really make sense with the with the actual story here, other than the fact that it's about dreaming. But, <laughs> but I didn't see any magic ship, so it's so supposed to be metaphorical. But really, considering the title of the original book, uh, which inspired Blade Runner, is supposed to be a reference to the fact that replicants, and they want to be humans, this from a thematic standpoint, has absolutely nothing to do with the actual episode it's been applied to. It's just a cool title, but <laughs> it doesn't mean sure, much in I this don't. context. It doesn't mean much in this context. So anyway, all right, so round one of Shadow Monster Hunting in Dreamscape Land. Sleepover at Castle Twilight and uh, with Luna immersing herself into the main six's own dreams to... With Pinkie Pie and Applejack sleeping in the same bed. Let the shipping begin. Uh, it's too late for that. Oh, by the way, you have to uh, like the fact that even when Pinkie Pie does not sleep, she's still super energetic while all the others were completely <laughs> sleep deprived. And it's, uh, yes, it's it's very apropos. Uh, visual gag, apropos, really funny and all that. Fluttershy dreams to be a pet, which yes. is, which let is... The let the fanfic be written. No, and uh, Applejack <laughs> dreams. Know they all be already be yeah, ready. I know, but I don't care. And Applejack dreams she has a big apple. You know the one that Father Shy ate last time. Speaking of which, eat it. Yes, they cut it open. Speaking of which, Father Shy turns into Flutterbot in the shared dream at the end of it. That was yeah. really interesting. I was ra rather surprised that. Uh, that she would do that uh, willi willingly. Well, it makes perfect sense that she would be able to do that because, you know, when she transformed into Flutterbot in the season 4 episode, which was a weird but a really fun episode, it was implied that she, she still had it in her to be to become the vampire fruit bat in, with that uh, completely self-serving cliffhanger ending. But now that she literally turned herself willingly into Flutterbot in her dreams, you know, I might start to think that Flutterbot represents Fluttershy's own self-confidence. Because when you're a Flutterbot, a vampire monster bat pony, you are nothing but confident. Hmm. So that would be... Yeah, that, she was. That's an interesting uh, visual information that was delivered to us, which might not lead to anything in future episodes, but it's nice to know that they remember Flutterbot. But what am I even surprised? They remember everything. They remember more things than I do about this show. <laughs> so, oh yes, I remember this. That's, this was a thing at some point, and I see everything in the dream, sh in the shared dream sequence. <laughs> that's um, that's nice. But anyway, I really like the idea at play in the shared dream sequence because after the freaking shadow monster gets away from the main six's own dreams. He started uh, one to... more thing before we move on. Rainbow Dash. Her dream. Yeah. She dreams of a of a ragged landscape where she fights hordes of changelings, and then it gets turned into a nightmare. We... Singing flowers. Okay, those flowers were the most terrifying thing ever. Okay, <laughs> honestly, the more. The more something is adorable and the more it is in your face about how adorable it wants to be, the more it feels forced its adorableness, the more creepy and terrifying the it gets. More because I want to kill it. Because there is a difference between cute things and things that want to look cute by force, by imposing 
their cuteness on you. And when that happens, it becomes really dark by contrast. That was a that yeah, was a just trying too hard. And by doing that, they become basically the animatronics in Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> <laughs> and Cannibal, the effect and everything. So, the, the, okay, that was nice. Uh, uh, but um, come to think of it, the Shadow Monster didn't do anything much creative in those dreams. Other than uh, ruining the entire orchard of Applejack, all it did was turn things into monsters. So that was into the... really, really half-assed monsters. Well, I I like those monsters weren't really terrifying. Well, I like the bunny angel monster, and I like for the shy. Yeah. And I, I like for the shy riding the bunny angel monster in the shared dream sequence. Really, that the shared dream sequence was fantastic because it went all out with imagination, and it was beautiful because. It wasn't just the fight of Luna and the main six, it was the fight of everybody in Dreamland Ponyville. So everybody fought with the power of their own imagination and subconscious, and it was great because of that, because everyone was contributing to this fight against the monster. I would have liked to see more. Well, it was only a 20 minutes episode long, so yeah, I'm, maybe you wanted to see a two maybe you wanted to see a two-parter. <laughs> <laughs> but, a two-parter would have been too long. Yes, yeah, so a two-parter would have been padded I out think, to death. I, I think uh, I stated it before. Just five more minutes. A 25-minute episode. Um, I would have used... Yes, I would have used five more minutes for that final resolution because it seems it was a bit rushed. I mean, I mean after they convinced Luna that she was only that she was her own worst enemy, that she was guilt-tripping herself for no reason, she didn't need to do that, it was unhealthy, she needed to get over herself, she needed to accept the fact that she made mistakes, like Pinkie Pie said, everybody makes mistakes, and she needs to accept that she is now a better person, because of those mistakes that were made, and, and now she was able to overcome. So, after all that is achieved, then the monster gets instantly defeated. That was a bit anticlimactic, I mean, it would have been better for the episode if there was a bit more of a struggle between Luna and the monster. The monster trying to resist her, and Luna trying to uh, force him, it, back into her. Instead, as soon as she got over herself, the shadow monster was like, oh, well, I guess the rampage oh, is I over. I need to forgive myself. Bing! Everything is fine. Okay, I'm going back inside. You'll never see me ever again. That's a bit disappointing, but then again, that's the problem when you have uh, with the limited duration of this episode and the type of big time scale story you were trying to tell here. Because let's face it, this was a an ambitious narrative for only one episode. Uh, usually, this kind of big narratives involving potential threats to the entirety of Equestria would have a two part episode uh, that would either end or begin a season. But this was only one episode, which was refreshing in a way, but also it had shortcomings due to limited duration. The same problem that we had with the Griffinstone episode. It was a bit rushed in parts. Yeah. But this was a great episode, nonetheless. Uh, I would have done with a little less of exposition and a little less of Luna just explaining things and just and only showing to us the suffering. But, nonetheless, this was well done and it was fun, well, especially the second part. It, it was well done, uh, the fact that this uh, Tantibus thing was always in the background when she said something, oh, it's all my fault, and you saw it grow. It wasn't really explained until the last... Yeah, moment. well, it, to be fair, that was supposed to be a twist, you know, that the creature was a product of her own guilt, which was implied in her own description of the beast earlier in the episode, but it didn't become clear up until that moment of revelation. And I had to say, that was a good revelation. And it, it makes all kinds of sense, and it really puts into perspective the very existence of this creature. Again, less explaining and more showing, but then again, that's par on the course for this series nowadays. There, we have to accept there, there are going to be characters explaining things at the end, at the beginning, or at the middle of certain episodes. <laughs> yeah, but um, that doesn't stop it from being uh, enjoyable. Mm. So, what, are we done already? <laughs> oh. 
we could go on about the different things we saw in the well there is a lot to green. talk yes there's a lot to talk about individually the various scenes like lyra bon literally becoming lyra bon fused together in the dream in the shared dream sequence therapy becoming a giant that emits a weird uh feline sounds and uh, Phil Theory uh, becoming uh, Iceman from X Men, but with money. <laughs> That's uh, that was that, that was nice. And of course, Big Mac transforming into an alicorn princess with the botched Sailor Moon theme, which was a nice reference that took me completely by surprise. And, uh, oh, another thing we we didn't mention: Scooter's giant wings. Yes, we know, but we know that already. We know that she dreams of being able, being able to fly. We know that she dreams about that already. Which only made it even more sad, if you ask me. <laughs> it qu- uh, kind of is. There's a lot going on in that in that third act, in that climax. That is like a, a city-scale battle between all of the inhabitants in Ponyville. Shoki is in... only five villagers take part. Well, yeah, but uh, to be fair... To be fair, you know how much difficult and costly it would be to animate all of those ponies at the same time? Might as well stick with the uh, ones that are more known. Yeah, we got Derby participating, we got Scootaloo participating, we yeah, got Spike participating. Filthy, filthy Rich, which was an interesting choice. I would have loved to see uh, Diamond Tiara doing something there, since he is supposed to be her father. Actually, you know, what I really liked about this episode, atop everything else, it was the very ending. When the main six are finally awake from their slumber battle, and they see Luna uh, sleeping in the middle of the room, and they wonder, I wonder what, what Princess Luna dreams of. And you know what does she dreams of? Sleeping. Dreaming. She, she dreams of dreaming. It's a dream. It's a dream within a dream. Beautiful landscape, by the way. Yeah, really nice landscape, by the way. But 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 this is my this is fantastic. And this tells so much about her character. She dreams of being able to dream. It's a dream within a dream. Dreamception. What? You, what? You're not going to do the warm? Oh, should I? Sure. Why not? Warm. Well, the moment has passed, so. Oh. But anyway, this, like I said, this tells a lot about her character in a very subtle and nuanced way. Unlike all that talking and exposition talking that was before, this tells so much more than her just yelling, "Oh, this is all my fault! Uh, emo this and emo that." This speaks much more volume about her character because being the princess of the night, being the one that infiltrates other ponies' dreams and protects them in their slumber during the night. It makes sense that her own dreams, her own good dreams that are not nightmares, would be just enjoying the fact of being able to sleep. Because that's how she takes a break. Hmm. And ideally, and ideally, uh, and also, but that's the most superficial meaning, the most intimate meaning of that scene is that she finally being able to dream to sleep and rest in her own dreamscape means that she's finally at peace with herself. So that's why I love this final scene, this final moment of the episode, because it speaks volume about the character, it brings a nice resolution to her conflict and arc in a subtle and nuanced way, and it's really pretty to look at too. So good job, guys. That was a fantastic, fantastic ending for a really enjoyable episode. If, it, and if I find that as a, as a huge sized picture, I will probably change my desktop background. <laughs> yes, uh, that was a really cool looking dreamscape and a representation of her own inner peace. That was great. That was great. See, they know how to be subtle and nuanced about what they want to communicate. I just wish they would do that more often instead of doing that show and tell thing they've been doing for this entire episode otherwise. Yeah. I have to stop this monster on my own. No, wait, I need your help. No, wait, it was all my fault. No, I'm so guilt tripping myself now. No, wait, now I'm not anymore. (laughs) Okay. 
So this has been uh, Do Princesses Dream of Magic Ship? Nice title doesn't mean anything. For a nice episode with a fantastic ending. And yeah. uh, we a enjoy it. A good Luna episode. A good Luna Thank you, Emma. Actually, you... actually, you know what? Not, not just a good Luna episode. This was a Luna episode. The first one since freaking season two, so... <laughs> Luna Eclipse. Which was a better Luna episode, but uh, uh, I love that episode. I I don't agree that it's a better Luna episode, uh, but um, it's a simpler one. I'll give it that. Sometimes simple is better, but uh, that episode did not have Luna's own dreamscape at display while she's sleeping in her own dream. Be I'm sorry, but that was such a good scene. I. <laughs> I love it. You love that scene. I you? love it so much because of how much it means in the context of the character herself and in the context of the of the conflict that she just overcame. It's genius! <laughs> okay. It's good. Genius? It's good. It's good is what I'm saying. It's really good. So, thank you for joining us, everybody. I think we said most of the most important things that needed to be said. If we forgot something, it, it means we either didn't notice it or we didn't think it was important enough to talk or about we it. Simply forgot about it. Also that. Which because we don't have a perfect memory. No, we and are also, just human. Also, we got stuff to do, so <laughs> we have to keep the memory occupied with other stuff too. That's not MLP. I know that for some of the bronies out there, it's difficult to imagine life without. Friendship is magic, but there is a life at the end of the tunnel of the basement. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Uh, so now that I finished offending some people that are way too sensitive for their own good. <sighs> thank you for joining us again, everybody. This has been the Double FP Podcast. I am Mad Dog Day Master, and I realize now we didn't do the presentations at the beginning of this podcast. Oh, well. But we started with, with Princess Big Mac. Yeah, whatever. And this has been That's SC... That's important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. And this has been SC2 Nightmare. Yes. SC2 Nightmare Moon from now on. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're also... Maybe I, should, you're, maybe I should rename myself into Tentabus. You know, that's not a bad idea. Also, that laugh. That laughter. Very close to the actual Nightmare Moon. So keep practicing. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to sleep, and we shall dream of uh, sh of magic ship and changelings and horrible singing flowers with creepy faces. Ah, so, play playing the flute. Ah. <laughs> now that's terrifying. <laughs> okay, bye now. Bye. Dreamception. Wow.